Hello everybody and welcome to a special reading to celebrate a special month. June is Pride Month where you we are celebrating the wonderful differences that we all have and encouraging everybody to celebrate you and be you and let your wonderfulness shine. So we are going to be reading a few chapters every evening this week from a an award-winning phenomenal book called George by Alex Gino. And we're going to start off today with uh, chapters one and two. And here we go. Chapter one, Secrets. George pulled a silver house key out of the smallest pocket of a large red backpack. Mom had sewn the key in so that it wouldn't get lost, but the yarn wasn't quite long enough to reach the keyhole of the bag rested on the ground. Instead, George had to steady herself awkwardly on one foot while the backpack rested on her other knee. She wiggled the key until it clicked into place. Stumbling inside, she called out, Hello! No lights were on. Still, George needed to be certain the house was empty. The door of Mom's room was open and the bed sheets were flat. Scott's room was unoccupied as, whoops, as well. Sure that she was alone, George went into the third bedroom, opened the closet door, and surveyed the pile of stuffed animals and assorted toys inside. They were undisturbed, too. Mom complained that George hadn't played with any of the toys in years and said that they should be donated to needy families. But George knew they were needed here to guard her most prized and secret collection. Fishing beneath the teddy bears and fluffy bunnies, George felt for a flat denim bag. Once she had it in hand, she ran to the bathroom, shut the door, and turned the lock. Clutching the bag in tightly wrapped arms, George slid to the ground. As she tipped the denim bag on its side, the silky slippery pages of a dozen magazines fell out onto the tiled bathroom floor. Covers promised how to have perfect skin, 12 fresh summer haircuts, how to tell a hottie you like them, and wild winter wardrobes. George was only a few years younger than the girls smiling at her from the glossy pages. She thought of them as her friends. George picked up an issue from last April that she'd looked through countless times before. She browsed the busy pages with a crisp flip, flip, flip that stirred up the faint smell of paper. She paused on a photo of four girls at the beach. They modeled swimsuits in a line, each striking a pose. A guide on the right-hand side of the page recommended various styles based on body type. The bodies looked the same to George. They were all girls' bodies. On the next page, two girls sat laughing on a blanket, their arms around each other's shoulders. One wore a striped bikini, the other wore a polka dot one piece with cutouts at the hips. If George were there, she would fit right in, giggling and linking her arms in theirs. She'd wear a bright pink bikini and she would have long hair that her new friends would love to braid. They would ask her name and she would tell them, my name is Melissa. Melissa was the name she called herself in the mirror when no one was watching, and she could brush her flat reddish-brown hair to the front of her head as if she had bangs. George flipped past flashy ads for book bag organizers, nail polish, the latest phones, and even tampons. She skipped over an article on how to make your own bracelets and another on advice for talking to boys. George's magazine collection had started by accident. Two summers ago, she'd noticed an old issue of Girl's Life in the recycling bin at the library. The word girl had caught her eye instantly, and she'd slipped the magazine in her jacket to look at later. Another girl's magazine soon followed, this time rescued from a trash can down the block from her house. The very next weekend, she'd found the denim bag at a yard sale for a quarter. It was just the size of a magazine and had a zipper along the top. It was as if the universe had wanted her to be able to store her collection safely. George settled on a two-page spread about framing your face with makeup. George had never worn makeup, but she poured over the range of colors on the left side of the page. Her heart raced in her chest. She wondered what it would feel like to really wear lipstick. George loved to put on chapstick. She used it all winter, whether or not her lips were really chapped. And every spring, she hid the tube from mom and wore it until it ran out. George jumped when she heard a clatter outside. She looked at the window, the front door directly below. No one was in sight, but Scott's bike lay in the driveway, the back wheel still spinning. Scott Spike. That meant Scott. Scott was George's older brother, a high school freshman. The hair on George's neck stood up. Soon, heavy footsteps climbed the stairs to the second floor. The locked bathroom door rattled. It was as if Scott were rattling George's heart inside her rib cage. Bang, bang, bang. You in there, George? Yeah? 
The shiny magazines were spread across the tile floor. She gathered them into a pile and stuffed them into the denim bag. Her heart was thumping almost as loudly as Scott's foot against the door. Yo, bro, I gotta go, Scott yelled from the far side. George zipped up the bag as quietly as he could and looked for a place to stash it. She couldn't walk out with it. Scott would want to know what was inside. The bathroom's one cabinet was stuffed with towels and didn't shut all the way. No good either. Finally, she hung the bag from the shower head and closed the curtain, desperately hoping that this wouldn't be the moment Scott discovered personal hygiene. Scott rushed in as soon as George opened the door, unzipping his jeans before he reached the toilet. George exited quickly, closed the door, and leaned on the wall outside to catch her breath. I have to let my dog outside. <laughs> he was scratching at the door. <laughs> the bag was probably still swinging in the shower. George hoped it wouldn't hit against the curtain or worse, fall and land in the bathtub with a thud. George didn't want to be standing near the bathroom when Scott came out, so she went down to the kitchen. She poured herself a glass of orange juice and sat at the table, her skin tingling. Outside, a cloud passed overhead and the room grew darker. When the bathroom door banged open, George jumped in her seat, splashing juice on her hand. She realized she'd been barely breathing. Thump, 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 thump. Scott tromped downstairs, a DVD case in his hand. He opened the refrigerator door, pulled out the carton of orange juice, and took a long swig. He wore a thin black t-shirt and jeans with a small hole in the knee. He hadn't gotten a haircut in months, and dark brown curls formed a mop on his head. Sorry if I busted in on you while you were taking a dump. Scott wiped the juice off his lips with his bare forearm. I wasn't taking a dump, George said. Then what took you so long? George hesitated. Oh, I know, Scott said. I'll bet you had a magazine in there. George froze, her mouth half open and her brain mid-thought. The air felt warm and her mind swirled. She pulled her hands on the table to make sure she was still there. That's it. Scott grinned, oblivious to George's panic. That's my little bro, growing up and looking at dirty magazines. Oh, George said out loud. She knew what dirty magazines were. She almost laughed. The girls in the magazine she was looking at wore a lot more clothes than that, even the ones at the beach. George relaxed at least a little. Don't worry, George, I won't tell mom. Anyway, I'm heading back out. Just had to get this. Scott shook the black plastic box he held in his hand and the DVD rattled inside. Haven't seen it yet, but it's supposed to be a classic. It's German. The title means something like blood of evil. When the zombies gnaw this one guy's arm off and kill him, this other guy has to use the gnawed off arm of his dead best friend to fight the zombies. It's awesome. Sounds gross, George said. It is, Scott nodded enthusiastically. He took another gulp of orange juice, put the carton back into the fridge and headed for the door. I'll let you get back to thinking about girls, Scott joked on the way out. George da dashed up to the bathroom, rescued her bag, and buried it deep inside her closet, under the toys and stuffed animals. She put a pile of dirty clothes on top just in case, and then she closed the door and collapsed face first under her bed, her hands crossed over her head, pressing her elbows to her ears and wishing she were someone else, anyone else. Chapter 2. Charlotte Dies. Ms. Udell leaned against her giant desk, reading to her fourth grade class from a tattered copy of Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. She wore her shiny black hair in a loose bun and wooden earrings dangled from her long earlobes. In her seat by the window, George couldn't listen. She couldn't think. Charlotte, the wonderful, kind spider, was gone and nothing was good. The whole book was about Charlotte saving the runt pig Wilbur, and then she goes and dies. It wasn't fair. George pushed her fists into her eyes, rubbing until rows and rows of tiny triangles twirled and twinkled brightly in the darkness. A tear dropped onto George's book and spread onto a spider web on the page. She breathed in carefully, trying not to make a sound. Shallow breath followed shallow breath until she was dizzy. She inhaled deeply, and as she did, she sniffled. Loudly, George heard whispers clear in the quiet room. Hey, some girl is crying over a dead spider. They ain't no girl, that's George. Close enough, followed by laughter. George didn't turn to look. She didn't need to. She knew exactly what she would see. Rick sat two rows over from George and Jeff sat behind Rick. Jeff would be leaning toward in his seat with his spiky hair nearly on Rick's shoulder. Rick would be leaning back in his shiny black baseball jacket and they'd both be holding their hands to their mouths like half-heartedly trying to keep quiet. Once, George and Rick had been friends, or at least friendly. In second grade, there'd been a class checkers tournament, and George and Rick had been the two best players. The final match of the competition had been close, with Rick barely winning after he'd been able to find his final piece. 
Even though George had lost, the two had still called each other checkers champs for weeks. In third grade, Jeff joined the class. Jeff had moved from California and wasn't happy about it. He started a few fist fights and threatened most of the boys at first, including George. But Jeff settled in by October, and once Jeff and Rick became buddies, Rick wasn't so friendly with George anymore. By winter break, Jeff and Rick were inseparable, and now it was as if the checkers champs were two kids who'd known each other once, but had never met either Rick or George. Ms. Udell glared at the snickering boys, cleared her throat, and read the final paragraph of the chapter. Her students were old enough that she rarely read aloud to them, but today she wanted them to be able to focus on what she called the magnificent melancholy of Charlotte's final moments. When she finished, Ms. Udell closed the book, placed it on top of a pile of papers on her desk, and removed her glasses. I'd like all of you to take out your journals and spend a few minutes with your reactions to this chapter. You may take a moment to reflect, but then get your pencils moving. I want you to dig deep and use some feeling words. Room 205 filled with the sounds of journals being removed from desks, pages being turned and pencils being searched for. Ms. Udell walked down the aisle toward Jeff and Rick and spoke to them privately. Her voice blended in with the noise of the room so George could barely hear her even though she was only two seats away. Some of us take death very seriously, Ms. Udell's words were icy. She looked at Jeff and Rick in turn. They each stared at their sneakers. It is a solemn topic, and I hope that you will respect yourselves, your classmates, and life itself by treating it as such. Jeff and Rick mumbled apologies. George wasn't sure whether their half-hearted stories were meant for her, Ms. Udell, or Charlotte. She wasn't sure she cared. The moment Ms. Udell turned away, Jeff rolled his eyes. Jeff was always rolling his eyes at something, usually with a snide comment to match. Ms. Udell passed by George's desk. To be honest, I'm not sure what I think of a person who doesn't cry at the end of Charlotte's Web. You didn't, George mumbled. I did the first three times, and a good number of times since, Ms. Udell paused, and for a moment it looked as if she might tear up right then. My point is, it takes a special person to cry over a book. It shows compassion as well as imagination. Ms. Udell patted George's shoulder. Don't ever lose that, George, and I know you'll turn into a fine young man. The word man hit like a pile of rocks falling on George's skull. It was a hundred times worse than boy, and she couldn't breathe. She bit her lip fiercely and felt fresh tears pounding against her eyes. She put her head down on her desk and wished she were invisible. Ms. Udell returned with a bathroom pass. It was a worn wooden block from a kindergarten class and read boys in thick green permanent marker on one side. George flipped the block over with a hollow slap so the side facing her read room 205. Ms. Udell put her hand on George's shoulder, but George shook her off and stood up. She could barely see her way to the classroom door through her tear-blurred eyes, and she navigated the hallway more than memory, more from memory than sight. She stumbled, sobbing, into the bathroom, the boys' bathroom. Her lips trembled and salty tears dripped into her mouth. George hated the boys' bathroom. It was the worst room in the school. She hated the smell of pee and bleach, and she hated the blue tiles on the wall to remind you where you were, as if the urinals didn't make it obvious enough. The whole room was about being a boy, and when boys were in there, they liked to talk about what was between their legs. George tried never to use it when there were any boys inside. She never drank from the water fountains at school, even if she was thirsty. And some days she could make it through school without having to go once. George put her head down close to the faucet and splashed cold water over her neck until she shivered. Then she rubbed a clump of paper towels on her head. She combed strings of still wet hair with her fingers and smiled weakly at herself in the mirror. Back in the hallway, George held the hall pass loosely in her fingers and let it drag along the wall, sending vibrations up her hand. The rhythmic click echoed down the hall as the wooden block skipped over the thin strips of cement between the tiles. George opened the classroom door slowly, fearing laughter, but students were too focused on their journals to notice her return. The topic, Personal Reactions, was written on the board in Ms. Udell's careful print. George pulled out her journal and wrote the date and the topic. By the time she had written Charlotte is Dead, journal time was over. Ms. Udell didn't ask anyone to read aloud. Instead, she addressed the class. Tomorrow, the real fun begins. For now, I'm pleased to say that we are done for the day. She spoke the rhyme as if it were a short poem. Put away your notebooks and we'll see each row is ready to get its things. By fun, Ms. Udell was referring to the play version of Charlotte's Web that the two fourth grade classes would perform for the younger grades. 
It was a school tradition that each spring, every student in the first through fourth grades read the same book. The first graders had the story read to them by their teachers, and sometimes even the kindergartners participated. Every grade then did some sort of project. As the oldest students participating, the fourth graders put on a play of the book for the younger grades as well as for the Parent Teacher Association. Only the fifth grade wasn't involved because they needed to focus on the spring tests to make sure they graduated and moved on to middle school. Ms. Udell had called four rows of students and the room was filled with the sounds of zippers and backpacks being dropped onto wooden desks. George's row was the last to be called and the kids in it had their eyes trained on Ms. Udell. Row one, chair screeched against the floor. George gathered her things slowly, stalling as long as she could before joining the boys' line. She wanted as much distance from Jeff and Rick as possible. Ms. Udell's class walked through the halls of the school and down to the yard. The bus kids were released as a group, while other children waited with Ms. Udell to meet up with their parents, grandparents, or babysitters. George headed up to her bus line. George, wait up, a voice called from behind her. Kelly, George's best friend, wore her hair in braids and smelled like oranges and pencil shavings. She wore a t-shirt that read 99% genius and 1% chocolate. My dad said you could come over this weekend to practice, she said as soon as she got to George. She'd been chattering about the auditions all week. You do still want to be in the play together, right? George did want to be in the play more than anything, but she didn't want to be some smelly pig. She wanted to be Charlotte, the kind and wise spider, even if it was a girl's part. Her mouth was open, but she couldn't speak. Kelly held up her hands, palms in front of George's eyes. I am Kelly, the all-wonderful and all-knowing. I can sense that you are not well. Now, my child, what seems to be your problem? She closed her eyes and slowly brought her hands to the sides of George's head, peeking just a little bit to make sure she didn't poke her best friend in the eye. If you're all-knowing, then why don't you know already, said George. Kelly opened her eyes long enough to cross them so that they pointed at her nose, like this. Then she fluttered her eyelids shut. Fine, I am Kelly the All-Wonderful and mostly knowing I will try to sense your problem. She opened her eyes again and dropped her hands. I know, you got stage fright. I know all about stage fright. My Uncle Bill says my dad has terrible stage fright and that's why he lets other people get rich performing his songs. It's not stage fright. Okay, maybe not. I don't think my dad has stage fright either. He's just a different kind of artist. Kelly shook George's shoulder. But then what is it? You know I can't have suspense. Tell me or I'll, or you'll what? Kelly's eyes gleamed with inspiration. Or I'll bring out my army of beasts to attack you in the night and suck out your brains with a crazy straw and make you one of my minions so you have to do everything I say, including telling me what you're thinking about. What is it? What is it? What is it? George looked around to make sure no one else could hear. Okay, okay, calm down. Here's the thing. I don't really want to be Wilbur in the play, she told Kelly. Oh, that's not a problem. There's a lot of other parts in the play. They're called supporting roles. My dad says the best star performers would be nothing without an excellent supporting cast. Let Ms. Udell hear you and decide what part you should have. I don't want just any part, said George. Well, what do you want to be? Templeton the rat? George shook her head. Avery? Kelly guessed. Mr. Zuckerman. Mr. Arabel. George still shook her head. Who else is there? Kelly asked. I want to be Charlotte, George whispered. Kelly shrugged. That's cool. If you want to be Charlotte, you should try out for Charlotte. You make such a big deal out of everything. Who cares if you're not really a girl? George's stomach dropped. She cared. Tons. On the street, one of the buses started its engine. I gotta go, Kelly broke into a run. One, two, three, she called behind her. Zoot, George replied. Back in first grade, Kelly and George decided that saying one, two, three, zoot was a lot more fun than saying goodbye. They had heard it on a cartoon and it made them laugh all day. Neither of them could remember anymore what show it was from, and sometimes it seemed silly to still be saying one, two, three, zoot, but neither wanted to be the first one to stop. That night, George dreamed she was on stage as Charlotte. She wore all black with extra limbs running down her sides, and she recited the most beautiful words for the entire auditorium to hear. Her first line was delivered perfectly, as was the second, but then there was a strange noise overhead. George looked up, but all she could see was the heavy stage curtain, which enveloped her in a stuffy darkness before knocking her off the ladder. Then she was falling and couldn't breathe for what felt like a very long time. George woke up in a sweat. It took a moment to realize she was awake in her bed and not suffocating. Her bedsheet was twisted around her legs. Still, she couldn't shake the image of being Charlotte. 
As she ate her cereal and milk, she dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. As she brushed her teeth, she pictured herself greeting the audience with a fine salutations. She should be the one to declare Wilbur terrific, and she should be the one to make people cry with her final farewell. And that is the end of chapter two. And I hope that you have enjoyed this first part of George. Um, if you would like to find more information and talking points, especially to talk to your child, there are wonderful recess resources <laughs> regarding this book. And I hope to see you back tomorrow with the next few chapters. Have a great day. Bye.